May you find happiness and peace. And may your home stand the test of time. Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mary today I'll be reacting to Charlie Kirk destroy socialist student argument. So without further ado, let's get started. Hello, my name is Devin. I'm a senior majoring in economics. I can confirm there are a lot of straight black men here at Stanford. Um, I'm on the left, um, and I, I can imagine you're going to have a lot of questions about race and immigration, but I wanted to push you on a more nuanced sort of set of economic thoughts, right? So I feel that on your side, you talk about free markets a great deal, and I just want to ask you, number one, how do you think that economic nationalism sort of uh, goes alongside sort of this Milton Friedman as you kind of, you all expound sort of sense of uh, free markets, they, they seem to be at contrast with one another. Economic nationalism is not a part of sort of uh, orthodox economic thought. Secondly, and it's only because I think the Stanford College Republicans, they had a table about why socialism is bad or whatever. Yeah, socialism sucks. Socialism sucks, socialism kills. Socialism's the worst idea of the 20th century, stuff like that. So we had a debate there as well as in another example, we were talking about property rights and things of that nature. Uh, one of the things that I brought up there is that, according to orthodox economics, if you underutilize sort of resources, land, labor, capital that you have, the government is doing an efficient thing by taking and redistributing those resources. And the question, and the response that I got from them where was essentially, free market's okay so long as it doesn't conflict with sort of the ideals we believe in. And I said, well, that's not really free market thinking. So my question to you is, again, sort of the, the principles that you have, you know, based on free markets, how does econo economic nationalism, how does that coincide with it, in addition to the sense of unused property rights? Okay, let's go to the second one. I'll kind of volley a question back to you. Do you think, based on peer economics and based on the utilitarian models that we have, that government's really more efficient at using idle and sedentary land, capital, and labor than the market? Well, to answer that, so if you take a uh, specific example of squatters' rights, that's a situation where the government isn't actually doing anything but saying well, give it, me a specific example of squatters rights where they're not taking an asset that could be owned privately no i'm saying is for instance if you have squatters rights and you just let and say that if someone moves into unused property let's say after six or seven years i guess depending on what sort of state that what state you're in you can stay in the house that's the government just saying okay people do what you're going to do that's not the government actually going out and seizing the property so you're, you're saying that when it's not owned privately, it's not owned publicly, and it's completely barren and has no, one, no, no, no claim owned, on it? No, no, it's owned by the person that decides to squat in it after the period of time because... Well, no, I mean, so, uh, if, if the land is not owned by anyone is what you're no, saying. No, it is. It is. That's, that's the whole premise. I'm I know, saying. but squatters' rights is a very rural, like, Wyoming, Montana, North and South No, Dakota, no, but it's, Nebraska, but it's a fair Kansas. example. I'm just, I'm just asking. No, I, I know, but so if you talk about, I mean, Th that's if, just if, you're, you're ta example. if you're taking a piece of private property from someone else and you think they're not, quote, unquote, using it, then you're doing a value imposition upon the owner of that piece of property because they might be storing capital behind that land, value behind that land, I should say. They might be using it for something in the future. So I would argue strongly against squatters' rights okay. and, and saying That's that, just a specific example. No, no, I understand. Generally. I asked for one. But the, the broader point is I would make the more nuanced argument for the second part, and I'll go back to economic nationalism, that the market is and always will be a better utility to use labor capital and um, land than any other, than the, the government ever could. It's more efficient. It's more widespread. So the market is really, really good at bringing prices down, bringing quality up, and making accessibility go horizontally. And we see that in every single vertical where the market is allowed to exist. Um, you see the quality of good go up, you see the price go down, and you see more and more people able to have it. So whether I, it be, I don't disagree with no, that. No, so I'm, I'm just saying that's the, yeah. that's the I'm, not, I'm not saying we disagree, I'm just saying that's where we come from. Sure. So we try to have market-based solutions to basically every problem that we come across, whether it be education, whether it be technology or finance, how can we incorporate timeless free market principles into pro structural problems that we have? So let's talk about the inner cities. Candace talks about this a lot. The government has a pseudo-monopoly on education right now. Okay, so bad teachers are not allowed to be fired. It costs 24,000 per pupil to educate an individual in Baltimore City Schools. Yet an independent study showed that 13 schools in Baltimore, they could not find one student in those 13 schools that was proficient in math or reading. That's a failed government monopoly. So we come at that problem, we say, all right, we know markets work. We've seen it work throughout the course of time with the standard living increase, prices go down. How can we incorporate market-based principles into a government-structured problem? So we come and we say school choice, school voucher choice, system, 100%. allowing parents be able to have competition in that sort of in that sort of community. Where, by the way, a Catholic school will better educate a student at nine thousand dollars a year, where the government will poorly educate a student at twenty-four thousand dollars a year. This is this is lovely. This is lovely. This is the reason why I've been pushing for you know, government should let you know people run their own school because you know, 
online government school whereby government just, you know, employs staff. They don't care if you're qualified or not. They just want, you know, teachers in their school. And both private schools, they want quality teachers. They check your, you know, degree. They make sure that aside from what is written in paper, you can deliver. And they inspect you. You know, you can be teaching and your proprietor or proprietress will walk through the class, walk, walk by and, you know, sit in a class and watch you teach the students, you know. And they want to really know that the students are learning. So that is why they build, they, they start competition whereby this, this private school competes with this private school so that they will see, yeah, if, if your school is good. And I think it's, it's working. And in private school, we have this teacher's assessment whereby you you rate your teacher based on their performance, you know, rate how they have pronto they are to school, how if they give you assignments, if they mark those assignments, if, you know, rate them so that the school will know that, yeah, this is how the teachers are performing and they give teachers to you know assessment so that they will raise their students and i think it's helped the school know if they need to you know do more work and it's to me i feel it's, it's better than government school and you know i i just loved it because in in africa everyone wants their children to go to you know private school because that is where you're able to learn more you know you, you meet more and more qualified teachers. And I get where the guy is coming from, you know. The main mention of property rights, you know, when you are not using a house for some time and someone decides to start staying in that house so the ownership should be given to the new person because you are not using it. So I feel like even if I'm not using something, it's mine. You see, I can, you know, get this phone when it's cheap, then, you know, leave it for some time before I start using it. That does not mean I don't want the phone. That is how, you know, I feel it's work. You know, in Africa, we, we buy land at a cheaper, you know, price, especially those undeveloped, you know, land, places that they've not, you know, started staying, you know, people have not inhabit. We just get those lands, leave them for a couple of years till development get to that side of, you know, the country. And by leaving those land for years, you know, the price of the land we appreciate and you can sell it later and make good money for yourself. And I think that is it, like, I, there is a reason why I'm buying it. That money I'm supposed to either spend it on myself or invest it in something else. But I decided to get a property, get a land, so that I can invest in that land. Because in Africa, land I appreciate a lot. You know, we don't pay property tax. So when you, you, you're able to get a land for yourself for like years and you sell that land, you get the money to yourself. Or when you build a house and wait for like five to six years and sell that land, that house at the you know, more expensive price, you get everything to yourself. Government don't tax you for your property. And that is just the joy of it. You know, being in Africa sometimes we we enjoy some of these, you know, you know, things for free without paying tax on them. And I think I, I never knew that people pay property tax till like a few days ago when I was watching a video of um one of Charlie Kirk's video and he was talking about property tax. And I was like, wow, so people really pay tax on property. And I think um we, we pay insurance, yes, insurance of in our car of okay, we pay insurance of our cars. But aside from that, that is it. We don't really just pay your insurance, you get your road worthy, and you're good. You're good to drive whatever you want to drive to. And we pay our, for our cars in full. We really don't enjoy this privilege of you getting your cars and paying instrumentally. No, we pay in full. And that is it. I feel in Africa, we're able to pay less taxes. Okay? And that, that's just it. And I feel what this guy is saying is totally wrong. If I build a house, I don't want anyone to be in my house except I ask you to stay there. You don't just stay in my house and end up claiming ownership of it simply because I am not using it. It is my property. It is my investment. I might be building it for my kids. I'm not building it for someone to just come there and take, take or make claim of it simply because no one is staying in the place. Anyway, this is a beautiful one. I enjoy this and I want to see more videos from Charlie. I, I love how smart the guy is, how... Well, maybe his questions are not smart, but he looks smart. This is really, really lovely. And I want to see more videos like this. If you have any recommendation, let me know in the comment section. It is a if, if this is your first time visiting the channel, click on the subscribe button. Thanks for watching. And remember this.